Bien, buenas tardes. Como coordinador local de European Students for Liberty, tengo el privilegio de presentar la ponencia de clausura que da fin a la Conferencia Regional Madrid 2014 y que estará a cargo del doctor James Lark, procedente de la Universidad de Virginia y personalidad de reconocido prestigio, no solo en el mundo académico, sino también por sus inestimables aportaciones a la sociedad. Fue presidente del Libertarian Party en Estados Unidos durante los años 2000 a 2002, siendo en la actualidad miembro del comité, de su Comité Nacional. Es un activista por la libertad al que todos nosotros admiramos y, sin más, les dejo ya con el doctor James Lark, que dará comienzo a la ponencia, a la ponencia Advancing the Liberty Movement. Please, doctor, when you want. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor to be able to address you today, and I will begin by apologizing that I cannot address you in Spanish. I always consider it a matter of courtesy to be able to address people in their language, and I would love to be able to give an address in Spanish. However, I was allowed into the country by the government with the explicit notion that if I tried to say anything in Spanish more sophisticated than Buenos Dias, they would put me in a bag, take me to the nearest boat or airplane, and get rid of me. <laughs> so I will, I, will, I will heed the warning and not try to address you in anything more sophisticated than Buenos Dias, the Buenos Tardes, the Buenos Noches. I'd like to thank European Students for Liberty for the tremendous hospitality that they've shown me, in particular Leon Hernandez. Um, it is a, again, I'm always impressed by the degree of kindness that I receive from libertarians around the world. Um, and I'm delighted finally to have the chance to visit Spain. I'm a big fan of Spanish food and Spanish football, so it's a wonderful opportunity to get the chance to see libertarians um, eat and watch football, so I'm going to indulge myself. I, if I may, I hope you'll allow me, I'd like to dedicate my comments to my mother. This is her 86th birthday today, and I'm having to miss her birthday by being here, so allow me to, uh, to wish my mother a very happy birthday and to dedicate my remarks to her. What I'd like to do today is to give you my perspective on how I see things developing in the liberty movement, uh, principally in my country, but around the world. Uh, my, my, uh, I do get around the world a little bit, so I like to flatter myself with the conceit that I can offer some comments that might be helpful concerning the worldwide liberty movement. So what I'll do is I'll talk about some of the things I see in the liberty movement, some progress. I'll talk about some of the problems that we face as we move forward. And then I will offer some advice for advocates of liberty, particularly student advocates, and I hope you'll find my comments to be useful. The battle for liberty takes place on many battlefields. As was mentioned, I had the honor of serving as the Libertarian Party's national chairman. Uh, they couldn't find anyone good to do the job, so they asked me to do it. So I served from the, the, the term 2000 to 2002, which was an interesting term, of course, 9-11 took place uh, at that time. That was a very interesting point for the Libertarian Party and the Libertarian Movement. I've been involved in the political battlefield for a while, but I've always felt that the political battlefield is one of many, and in many ways it is not the most important battlefield. A lot of libertarians look at politics as being very important. I tend to look at the intellectual battlefield as actually the one that is of greatest importance. And if we look at what has happened over the last, well, certainly since the foundation of the Mont Pelerin Society in 1947, I think that libertarian progress in the world of ideas has been nothing short of breathtaking. Again, go back to the foundation of the Mount Pelerin Society in 1947. At that time, a large part of Europe was still in ruins at the end of World War II. You had socialist governments in everything except name in both the United States and in Great Britain. Marxism was not the dominant ideology in the intellectual battle, but it was certainly a very strong contender. Welfare state liberalism, I think, clearly was the dominant intellectual orthodoxy 
among people who think about the ideas of individual liberty and the state. And liberty was in many ways in a very bad situation. Well, if you come forward from that point, we have made enormous progress. In my country, people who understand the libertarian perspective of individual liberty and personal responsibility and who disagree with our perspective, people who embrace a much larger government than we would, they are now having to spend their time and effort attacking libertarians. In my country, there are a couple of publications, uh, one in particular, a publication of so-called progressive, Salon. Rarely a day goes past where they don't publish something that is basically a naked attack, in many cases an inaccurate naked attack, on the libertarian perspective. And I see this as a wonderful sign because more and more on the battlefield of ideas, people are starting to understand the, in, the libertarian perspective, individual liberty coupled with personal responsibility. I think the evidence that has been gathered is very, very strong that societies based upon the principles of individual liberty coupled with personal responsibility, where governments, to the extent they have any validity at all, exist by virtue of the, uh, the agreement of the people who are bound by those governments, and that when governments go beyond their narrowly constituted function of protecting our rights, they should be altered or abolished, as Mr. Jefferson would say. By the way, I have the honor of teaching at Thomas Jefferson's Academical Village, the University of Virginia. More and more, we're seeing the creme de la creme, the bright, talented young people around the world who are starting to embrace the libertarian perspective. And by the way, the term libertarian, in English at least, is an adjective as well as a noun. Many people are self-identified libertarians. I think I qualify as a self-identified libertarian. But there are many, many more people who are libertarian in terms of the way they analyze issues. So they may not identify themselves, they may not call themselves libertarians, but their basic perspective is one of starting from the idea that government should not act unless there is a very strong, a compelling reason for it to do so. And those people, more and more, we're seeing people who are starting with what is essentially a libertarian point of view. I put it in, in athletic terms in some cases. I was a, in English we say Jim Lark was a jock. Jock is a term for people who are athletes. I was a basketball and soccer player as a younger man and like a lot of men my age, the older I get the better I used to be. Two years from now, World Cup star. If you look at the battle for liberty on the intellectual battlefield in boxing terminology, we're in the third, maybe fourth round of a 15-round prize fight. The, 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 content, the guy wearing the championship belt is welfare state liberalism. Marxism, by the way, is not dead by any means, but as the English would say, it's not at all well. There are very few people these days who really believe anything that Marx wrote. In fact, there, <laughs> I, I've, I've used the term, a Marxist is someone who believes something that Marx wrote. A Marxian is someone who read something that Marx wrote. We're seeing more and more, the English Marxists, who are amongst the nastiest bastards on the planet, they've been mugged by reality. They're now trying to come up with ways to use the market to produce goods and services, to get the goods out of the woods, as Robert, as, as, as a friend of mine used to say. But they're trying to use political control to allocate those resources. So I think Marxism is, again, it's, it's still around, unfortunately, sort of like the, the flu. It's probably always going to be with us, but it's not as, it's not as virulent as it used to be. The dominant, to the extent there is a dominant intellectual uh, notion, is welfare state liberalism. In other words, nominal ownership of the means of production. You can own private property, at least in title, but it's not really yours because you're paying very high taxes, you're heavily regulated. As we say in English, you, you rent rather than owning. But the libertarian perspective is the top challenger to welfare state liberalism. And people who are welfare state liberalism, they are scared because they see more and more bright, talented young people 
are adopting libertarian ideas. They are identifying as libertarians. They are using libertarian analysis to criticize social institutions. And as the evidence of the problems of the overly large, overly expensive, overly intrusive state continue to build up, you simply can't avert your eyes for too long. The problems of big government are manifest, and more and more people, particularly young people, are starting to understand these ideas. So on the intellectual battlefield, I think we're making tremendous progress, and we're going to continue to make tremendous progress. Why? Because to put it bluntly, ladies and gentlemen, our ideas are right. Society is based upon principles of individual liberty and personal responsibility are better societies by any reasonable standard. Societies in which people are able to pursue their vision, their dreams, their God, the only restriction is they don't violate the like rights of their neighbors. That's a truly beautiful, compelling vision. And we of libertarian disposition should never, we don't want to be nasty or snotty, but we're right. Our ideas are better ideas. And I think in a fair fight, people will choose liberty. Liberty will be the preferential option. So I tend to be very confident. Now, I should also note that there are problems that we face as we go forward. We face a wide variety of problems. I have the honor of teaching a lot of statistics classes at the university. I'm really a mathematician. I hang my shingle in an engineering school, but I'm really a mathematician. And statisticians have a term called selection bias. The liberty movement faces a very interesting selection bias problem in that most libertarians hate politics. Every one of you in this room is at least one standard deviation outside the norm because you were willing to invest your valuable time to participate in active libertarian movement. You're all unusual. In fact, I'm willing to bet you're probably two or three standard deviations outside the norm. Most libertarians simply want to live their lives in peace and harmony with their neighbors. They're not interested in being involved in politics because libertarians, by and large, don't see politics as a way of solving the big problems of human society. Po government, by the way, is a blunt instrument. It can do certain things reasonably well. For example, it can kill people in great big bleeding batches. But by and large, government simply doesn't have the knowledge to solve most of the problems of the human condition. If we wish to have a better society, we need to use civil society. We need to use voluntary, peaceful means to try to help our friends and neighbors. Government simply can't do the job. However, because of that, many libertarians are not willing to get involved in terms of purposeful political action. And by the way, when I use the phrase political action, I do not mean just partisan political activity, being involved with a particular partisan political organization. I mean, in many cases, political activity of an issue nature, where you're looking at particular issues. My experience is most libertarians are just not willing to get involved. There's an old joke, anarchists of the world unite. Many libertarians just won't get involved, and I think this is a major problem for us. Also, we face, as you're probably aware, a hideous problem that as we try to reduce the size and scope of government, we try to get government to its proper function of protecting our rights. We face the problem of concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. Many of the things we see, at least in my country, where we see all manner of rules and regulations that I don't think could ever survive an up or down vote of the people. Why? Because they're stupid rules and regulations. They're darned expensive and they benefit a small number of people. But that's the point. Much of what we see in terms of government, people who are the beneficiaries of government action may be relatively few in number, they may be very few in number, but the benefits are substantial and concentrated. The costs to all of us, to the many, 
It may simply be that it's not worth our time and effort to go and fight them. I'll give you a brief example. Several years ago, in my neck of the woods, Albemarle County, Virginia, there was an issue of property rights that did not involve me. It was a, basically some people wanted to put houses on their own property. I spent four and a half hours to go and give a one-minute speech on an issue that did not affect me. Now, the vast majority of civilized human beings can't do that sort of thing. I'm a university professor. As we like to say, I, I didn't want to have to work for a living, so I became a university professor. I get paid in time in many cases. And so I'm also insane. So I, can, I, can, I will make the time to go and invest four and a half hours to give a one-minute speech on something that does not affect me personally because I have very strong ideological preferences for how government should operate. Most people simply don't have that kind of time. The effort that takes just, people, just for people to become informed about particular issues is probably, the, the time value of their money is probably much greater than the actual out-of-pocket cost they face by virtue of this action. So as we've known for, I'd say, roughly 250 years, we have concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. It is very hard to build coalitions to shrink the size and scope of government simply because most people are too busy living their lives to get involved in changing things, whereas the people who are the beneficiaries of overly large, overly intrusive, overly expensive government, they know where the benefits are and they have very strong incentives to mobilize. Another problem we face, and I think sometimes we of libertarian disposition underestimate the, the, the difficulty of this issue. Many libertarian ideas are counterintuitive. When I try to explain to people in the United States that having a war on drugs, drug prohibition, that this is one of the worst things you can do if you wish to deal with the problems of drug abuse by virtue of making these substances illegal, you unleash all manner of horrible problems. If you want to clean up the problems of drug abuse, arguably the first step is to end drug prohibition, to get rid of the rules, the prohibitions, against what you can ingest for your health, safety, or comfort. Leave aside, by the way, the moral issue. And I'm, I believe that it's simply none of the government's business what you put in your body for your health, safety, or comfort. If I wish to ingest heroin or cocaine or oysters, <laughs> that's my business. I should take responsibility for whatever actions I take while under the influence of those substances, but it's just not the business of government. However, for many people, if you show them, and I think the evidence is extremely strong, if you show them or if you try to explain to them that we need to end government pro drug prohibition, if we want to stop abuse or at least reduce the, the problems of drug abuse, for many people that's completely counterintuitive. If you point out that minimum wage laws in many cases hurt the very people that they're supposedly intended, in other words, if you mandate a, a price on labor, you may price people out of the job market. For many of our friends and neighbors, that is completely fantastic. How could that possibly be? If we want, to people, we want to help people, we need to raise their wage rates. Well, in many cases, you're pricing them out of the market. We of libertarian disposition, or at least people who understand economics, understand this very well. But many of our friends and neighbors, this is completely counterintuitive. In my country, we have something called the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. The FDA has police powers to regulate what you can put in your body for your health, safety, or comfort, what foods you, you eat, for example. The idea that the FDA, by virtue of its regulation of medical devices, drugs, potions, and the like, that it may have killed more people than it saved because it kept potentially life-saving drugs off the market. For many people, that's completely counterintuitive. So we need to understand when we share our ideas with people, these ideas may seem completely alien. By the way, there's, a, there's an apocryphal story, I'll share it with you, um, about when, when the Soviet Union came crashing down, there was a free market conference in St. Petersburg, 
and supposedly a free marketeer talked about, and I don't know whether he was trying to be funny or whether he actually, whether this was actually serious. He said, here in Russia, we need to move to civil society to help. But of course, there are certain things only government can do, such as roads, military, and bakeries. <laughs> now we laugh at that, but if you've grown up in a society where you've never seen the private production of bread, You've never seen how private people acting completely voluntarily can marshal the resources to produce bread and then distribute it. The idea of private production of bread might seem utterly fantastic. One of the reasons, by the way, that I think libertarians have trouble with this is precisely because we have thought about these issues for a long time. These issues, the idea of ending drug prohibition if we want to reduce the problems of drug abuse, these, these ideas have almost become second nature to us. And it may be difficult for us to understand how other people might have difficulty with them, precisely because we've thought about it for so long. I'm a very bad violinist. I was, a, I was the concert master of my hometown orchestra. You've heard, and we say in English, the, the, this, you've heard of the blind leading the blind. This was the deaf leading the deaf. There are certain things I can do as a violinist now that I could not hope to do when I was a younger man because I practiced. I, I can do these things. I don't have to think about them. When we explain liberty ideas to people, we sometimes forget maybe it was difficult for us to understand these ideas at some point in the past. And as we go forward, we need, to we need to understand that maybe there was a time when we didn't understand these issues and we have to have a certain degree of patience with those to whom we explain these things. Now, as we look forward, I tend to be very optimistic for reasons I mentioned previously. I think by any reasonable standard, libertarian societies are better societies. When people have the opportunity to compare apples to apples and not apples to oranges or apples to rocks, people tend to choose more liberty rather than less. And I think if we can get people to make, to make a comparison where they're actually comparing apples to apples, if we get a fair fight, liberty will be the preferential option. And so what I'd like to do is to share a few ideas with you as you, for, as advocates of liberty, let me share some ideas with you that might be helpful to you. The first two are ones that I always share, particularly with student activists, two very simple principles. The first is we have to uphold the highest standards of intellectual integrity. We have to apply the same withering scrutiny to our own ideas that we apply to the ideas of people with whom we supposedly disagree. I've seen lots and lots of intellectual sloppiness from my fellow libertarians. We don't like it when people treat our ideas sloppily, stupidly. We have to be willing to subject our own ideas to scrutiny. We have to be willing to listen to other people who would like us to understand their ideas. If we want people to understand our ideas, I think we need to show them the intellectual integrity that will take their ideas seriously. The second point is, treat people with courtesy and respect. I found most people in the world are pretty decent. They're not angelic, they're not heroic, but they're pretty decent. And if you engage people with courtesy and respect, you will usually find they'll at least listen to you. And if you can just get people to listen to you, you may not get them to understand and embrace your ideas. But if you can get people to listen to you, you may perform an extraordinarily valuable task, one that is almost always undervalued by libertarians, and that is you may clear away the misconceptions. Because in so many cases with which I'm familiar, when people argue against libertarian ideas, they're not actually arguing against our ideas. They're arguing against some very bad misconceptions, some very bad caricatures of what they think the libertarian perspective is all about or what libertarians are interested in. I suspect many of you, as you've reached out to people, 
have encountered criticisms. Oh, you libertarians don't care about the poor. You libertarians don't care about the environment. You libertarians are bad, nasty, evil people. If you treat people with courtesy and respect, if you listen to their ideas, if you listen to their criticisms, and offer a serious, a serious intellectually in a, a lecture with intellectual integrity, I think you will usually find people will listen to you and you can clear away their misconceptions. And if all you do is clarify bad impressions, if all you do is clear away bad misconceptions, you have made tremendous progress. Because if you get people to understand where the real disagreements are, they may say, you know, those libertarians, I actually agree with them on lots of issues. In the United States, we, we ask this, this old question, it's a joke, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do we roll back overly large, overly expensive, overly intrusive government? Well, in many, I think it's going to come one bite at a time. And if you can clarify what libertarians are all about, it very well may be that that person with, to whom you're sharing your, your ideas, that person may not come over and become an active libertarian, but that person may decide, I agree with those libertarians on some important issues, let's work together. If nothing else, you may help people understand, you know those libertarians, the world's not going to go to hell if they're put in positions of responsibility. Because in politics, most people don't get involved because they love you, it's because they hate you. If you clarify misconceptions, you treat people the right way, you'll usually find that people will listen to you. Another point that may be helpful, particularly for student activists, student activists have a very difficult job because in many cases when you reach out to your fellow students, you may be the first thoughtful libertarian that those people have encountered. And your reward for offering libertarian ideas to these people may be hostility. These people may say, well, how can anybody believe that? You libertarians, you don't care about the poor, you don't care about the environment. However, the seeds you plant may germinate beautifully down the line and you'll never know how much good you've done through your activism. So I encourage you, as you go forward, to understand you may be changing the world and you'll never know it. So you must always be ready to step forward and to explain these ideas with courtesy, respect, and integrity. Because in some cases, the seeds that you plant are going to have an extraordinarily powerful impact. And it's very easy for libertarians, whether they're student activists or community activists, to become discouraged because in many cases, the feedback we receive as we explain our ideas is one of hostility, and we don't see the rewards down the line. Another point, when we reach out to people, we need to understand that we are asking them in many cases to undergo a very painful self-examination. Okay? If I were to ask my friend Leon Hernandez, Mr. Hernandez, who are you? My guess is that in defining himself, a very large part of what he will discuss are his beliefs, his principles. In other words, what makes Leon Hernandez, Leon Hernandez is his belief in liberty, in, in, in a proper libertarian society. Well, many of the people with whom we're trying, with whom we're dealing when we explain libertarian ideas, many of these people may have embraced some very bad ideas for many years. And when we explain to them, for example, there may be people in your communities who believe very strongly in helping working people. They want to help working, they genuinely want to help people who they consider to be working people. And they may support all sorts of rules, regulations, legislation that may actually have hurt people. Minimum wage laws being an example. Well, if you explain to people, if you show them the evidence that minimum wage laws hurt the very people the supporters of those laws wanted to help, 
it would be very painful for them to encounter that. Think of it. How many of you would like to be shown evidence that a libertarian society is, is, a, is actually a crummy society? It's not a good society. I don't think we would enjoy that. And we need to understand, when we explain the ideas, when we point out the problems of big government, we may be asking people to undergo a very painful self-examination we might not want to undergo. So we have to have a certain sense of humility. We have to have a certain sense, I think, of empathy and sympathy. I could go on for several hours discussing these various things. I think it would be appropriate now to open it up to questions, comments, arguments if you have them, and I'll, we'll, just, we'll just let it go where, where the discussion goes. And I hope someone is, is watching the time so that uh, when, when we've gone too long, someone will come up with a hook and drag me off the stage. Are there any questions or comments? No questions or comments? Well, I, have I taken care? I'm sorry, the, the, the gentleman over there. Yes, sir. You can scream if you want. I, I can't hear you, sir. Allow me. The gentleman has raised, I, did everyone hear the gentleman's question? He was making the point about that in many cases when we explain things, it's possible that market arrangements will not necessarily be the most efficient in some cases, but they happen to be morally just. Let, let me, let, there are a couple of points that actually he didn't make. Let me, let me raise a few things with you. First of all, when I reach out to people, my perspective is I don't convince anybody of anything. What I try to do is facilitate conditions by which people convince themselves. I want to ask questions in a polite, respectful manner so that people convince themselves. And I, I do this, one, because I think people are more likely to embrace our ideas. And also, I've never met anybody who likes to feel that, you know, I was stupid, I was wrong, and somebody shoved my ignorance down my throat, and, and that's how I found out that I was wrong. I try to facilitate conditions by which people convince themselves. Now, to the gentleman's particular point, I'm a libertarian on moral grounds. I have certain notions about what the appropriate relationship is between the individual and the collective. And ultimately, I just feel there are certain things the collective has no right to do. I don't care if they might be efficient in some sense. It's just not right for government to do these things. I don't believe in initiating violence or fraud against others. It's quite possible that on certain discrete issues, you can make an argument that government actions of the sort we tend not to like might be, in some sense, more efficient, at least with respect to those discrete issues. Ultimately, however, I'm a libertarian on moral grounds, and I think we ultimately look at, is a particular action of, of government, of the collective, is it morally right? So ultimately, I come at these things from the moral perspective. However, I think we libertarians, in many cases, allow ourselves to be put in a bad situation. First of all, where we have to defend liberty. In my opinion, the default value should always be liberty is, is the grounding here, and that anyone who argues in favor of government, the burden of proof should be upon them. We shouldn't have to defend liberty. People who want to use the government to do things, the burden of proof should fall upon them. And I don't think there's anything wrong with our pointing out very politely, excuse me, government is essentially organized force. I don't feel I have to defend liberty. I think the burden of proof is on you. 
The second point is, in many cases, we allow ourselves to be put in a situation where we have to answer the wrong question. Let me give you an example. A major issue around the world, a major political issue in the United States is so-called anthropogenerated global warming. In other words, is human activity causing, forcing, some sort of change in our environment that will ultimately be deleterious to large parts, not necessarily the United States or Western Europe, but perhaps people in the Pacific Isles and the like. I'm agnostic on the science in the sense that I would be surprised if there is not some sort of human forcing. I would be surprised if there isn't something going on. However, I've seen very little evidence that the forcing, that whatever forcing is going on is actually going to lead to some sort of global apocalypse. Now, contrary to rumor, I've been wrong before. And so as a matter of science, and I think this is a matter of science, I'm open to be convinced. However, in many cases, when people who are not libertarians are arguing in favor of government action, we libertarians allow ourselves to answer the question, you know, is the market going to work? In many ways, that's the wrong question. The question is, well, the mar is not whether the market will work, because you have, first of all, have to have a notion of what will work means. The question, the better question is, will market solutions be likely to work better than any conceivable alternative arrangement? In so many cases, people put us in a situation where they say, well, will a libertarian society achieve this result? And usually the standard that's applied is they're asking us, will the libertarian society achieve perfection? Well, in a libertarian society, would we have poor people? My answer is probably yes. Are we likely to have poor people with the sort of constellation we now have with government programs? Yes. In many cases, people put us in a situation where they are forcing us to essentially say, well, we're not able to produce or guarantee perfection, therefore government can step in. Well, government has its own problems. And what we need to do when we're put in a situation where we're addressing these questions is we need to make sure the right questions are being asked. It's not so much, will the market work in the sense of eliminating problems? The question is, will the market work better than government? And in many cases, we know there are horrible problems when government gets involved. Do we have time for one question? Last question. Thank you, Mr. Locke. Uh, I enjoyed your, your lecture. Since the, the libertarian movement is growing steadily and is bigger than ever, but at the same time, uh, personal and economic freedoms are shrinking everywhere, do you think the libertarian movement is doing something very wrong? And the, the, if that is the case, what issue would you... The, 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 gentleman, the gentleman raises an excellent point, and this is something that has caused many libertarian friends of mine in the United States to feel... I, there, there's an old joke. If you think things can't get any worse, are you an optimist or a pessimist? It sounds better in English, I think. Um, Many libertarian friends of mine observe co completely correctly that we have seen tremendous diminution of certain rights that we have. In some cases, I think they have not observed the fact that there have also been swings in the right direction. For example, on a lot of personal liberty issues in my country, we have seen things liberalized considerably. Um, the status of women, for example the status of affectional matters, if you wish to be affectionate <laughs> toward someone of your gender. There used to be laws against that. Now those laws in the United States are no longer, they're, they're either, they're getting rid of those laws. Um, African Americans in my country suffered under substantial burdens. When I, in fact, when I was a boy, when I started going to school, I actually went to segregated schools the first two years of my, I mean, there were schools that were for Caucasians and there were schools for African Americans. Thankfully, we don't have that sort of, we don't have that sort of de jure segregation anymore. So I think there's a tendency, particularly for, for those of us of libertarian disposition, 
to focus on the diminution, in some cases not observed, where we actually are making progress. The second point, and it should always, it should always be noted, some people use the analogy of an ocean liner, a big ship sailing across the ocean. It takes that ship a while to turn around and go the other direction. So we got into this situation, I say we, uh, looking at the United States experience, of course, you know, your experience in Spain it may be very, very different. In the United States, we've been moving in a big government direction now for roughly 150 years. And the people who put us in that direction, they have worked tirelessly to enlarge the size and scope of government. Given the many problems many selection bias issues that we libertarians face, it should not be surprising that it's taking us a while to reverse course. Also, let me note that while I tend to be optimistic, I don't have a what's called a Whig theory of history. I don't think history always marches upward toward progress. It is quite possible that we may reach a point, an equilibrium point, where essentially we have big government, or at least much bigger government than we libertarians would tolerate. We don't see it expanding a lot, and there are times where it contracts a little bit. You know, we have, it's sort of like a pendulum swinging back and forth, but basically around an equilibrium point that's much larger government. It's a possibility. And again, we face a lot of severe problems, not least of which is the forces of reaction are strong. There are many people who benefit tremendously by virtue of big government. And it is unduly optimistic for us to think that they're going to give up these powers without a fight. Hopefully, not a fight with guns. Hopefully, we can do it peacefully. By the way, I've always told my friends, I don't know if, I don't know if this will come through in English, I've told my friends that God forbid we should ever have to take up arms to reclaim our liberty because if that happens, I will not live to see the promised land because I'll be back up in the hills with my various fouling pieces. Some statist will plop a sign in the meadow that says free beer and I'll come wandering out looking for the free beer and I'll get shot to little itty bitty libertarian pieces. So let's hope we don't have to reclaim our liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to be here. I'm always honored when I have the chance to gather with heroes for liberty, paladins of liberty who are making a difference, who are changing the world. You have honored me by your presence. Thank you very much.